Jesus went throughout Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness among the people. News about him spread all over Syria, and people brought to him all who were ill with various diseases, those suffering severe pain, the demon-possessed, those having seizures, and the paralyzed, and he healed them. Large crowds from Galilee, the Decapolis, Jerusalem, Judea, and the region across the Jordan followed him. Now when he saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him, and he began to teach them. Hi everybody, Pastor Gina Spivey here. This is my family. This is my husband, Dennis. This is Dominic. Hi. And Peyton. Hi. And these are our dogs, Eddie and Zach. And we're going to be reading from Matthew 5, starting in verse 3. Okay. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Bye. 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 I want to say thank you to Pastor Gina Spivey, oversees our special needs ministry, and her husband, Dennis, and her kids, Peyton and Dominic, for uh, reading the scripture for us this week. They read through the Beatitudes, and as kind of that introductory scripture reading indicated, we're in the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus is teaching his disciples with crowds gathered around. We're looking at Matthew 5, 6, and 7, this one of the early messages, and it is the longest message without interruption that Jesus gave. Uh, that's found here in Matthew 5, 6, and 7. We're looking at this throughout the summer, and I look forward to just a great journey together. We've already had a few sermons in this series, and I think this is a, a, a great way for us to understand God's kingdom values that he teaches, Jesus teaches in the Sermon on the Mount, and how we live them out here on earth today. So thank you, Gina and family. Also, I'm so grateful for that video with the different worship leaders from different churches leading in worship. That's... Um, such a great thing to see at this time and uh, know we have other brothers and sisters in Christ who are serving the Lord well and that the church is thriving and we have great opportunities together in the Caneo Valley. Now, there have been a lot of things happening last week and there have been some memes. Some have been pretty mean-spirited, but on social media, these memes are a picture with a thought and one that I came across I thought was quite uh, interesting is this little girl working over her homework and it says, kids in 2049 trying to memorize all that happened in 2020. There have been so many things with the COVID-19, now the racial tensions and the, the protests and the riots, and then even now there's a tropical storm about to move into the Gulf Coast states, and uh, this is quite a year already, and I can imagine how if they teach this year to students then and all the details, it'll be quite a, a, a hard thing for them to learn. Now, we've been talking about the Beatitudes that are part of the first part of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. And we looked at the first four last week, and we'll look at the last four today. And uh, we're talking about if you want to be happy, part one last week, part two this week. We're looking at Matthew 5, 3 through 12, where these eight Beatitudes, these statements where Jesus says, blessed or happy, despite your circumstances, to be happy despite your circumstances. And then he gives the qualities, these, these things we want to build into our lives as the follower of Christ. If, as we look into this passage again, I want us to see that if you want to be happy, learn what Jesus says will make you happy and build that into your life. And here are eight things he says will bring satisfaction and meaning, happiness despite your circumstances, and we need to pay attention to them and build them into our life. We looked last week at the first four. You can go back and look at part one of this sermon from last weekend. Um, but we want to review those first four so we remember where we are as we look at the last four. If you want to be happy, understand who you are before God. 
understand who you are before God. And this is found in uh, verse 3 of Matthew 5. It says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are, are those who are poor in spirit. We say that's not financial, but that is, is actually our humbleness before God, knowing we're a sinner in need of a Savior, and then we have to walk with that Savior through life in our broken world. Then secondly, the second beatitude is grieve over the groaning of this world. Grieve over the groaning of this world. I don't know about you, but I've been lamenting this week over the brokenness and the heartache that's there in our nation. Uh, verse 4 of Matthew 5, blessed are they that mourn, for they will be comforted. Grieve over the groaning of this world. Number three, the third beatitude is, show a surprising gentleness toward others. This is something that surprises folks. They expect you to be aggressive, but there's to be a gentleness. Verse 5 says, blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. That word meek means to be gentle. And it's a gentleness in a situation where people wouldn't expect you to be gentle. Show a surprising gentleness toward others. The fourth beatitude is cultivate a deep longing for righteousness where it's so deep down, it's like hunger and thirst. You long for righteousness. You hunger and thirst for it. We talked about how there's a legal righteousness where we keep the commands and we do what we're supposed to do. Then there's a moral righteousness that comes from the character that the Lord is developing in us as we become more like Jesus on the inside day by day, and that character then helps us pursue righteousness. And then the third one we talked about was social justice. We talked about justice, uh, social righteousness, where we speak up and we plead the case of those who suffer injustice in our culture and in our society. And every culture and every society, there has been injustice, but it doesn't mean we stay silent. It means we step up and speak for them, and that is a part of what we should be longing for deeply in our lives. Now, last week I brought up the issue of uh, race and the concerns and the tension that's in America right now. And um, I know based on some of the email, I might have left some of you uh, wondering what I thought about this or what I thought about that. And I appreciate the spirit in which the vast majority of the email I received um, communicated with me. And I got it really from two different perspectives. Um, some people heard a sentence I said and, and thought I meant this and that this would be then the outgrowth of that thought. And others heard that sentence and said, no, I meant the opposite and thought it this way. And to look at those was interesting. So I want to be a little clearer if I can this week and forgive me if I confused you in any way. Um, doesn't mean you won't be uncomfortable in my message at some point today, but I want to ask you to listen to my heart. Be careful to just get tripped up on uh, a word I say here or there, but listen to my heart as I want to share with you how these Beatitudes, all eight of them, but specifically these last four, uh, fit into our current situation in America so well. There's an application right before us for our own lives, for our church, for our community, and even our nation and world. Uh, it's interesting, we had laid out to go through the Sermon on the Mount a while ago, and to be at this point with the Beatitudes, at the same time there's so much tension in our country, I think is of the Lord, and God is doing something, even in this brokenness, even in the pain, even with all that we've seen on TV, the Lord is sovereignly doing something, and I want you just to hear my heart today, I want to encourage you to listen to my entire message, don't, don't get uh, offended or bothered by something I say and just turn off the TV or the computer or your mobile device because I'm, uh, th this is an entire message and there are going to be different things that come up at different stages in that. So I, I appreciate that. Now in the voices that I've heard, even as I said, they were respectful. There were a lot of questions. There were a lot of assumptions about what I believed about this or that. And I think part of the issue for us is that we've got a couple of different voices. There are voices I've heard this week that say, uh, Pastor this one side, uh, you know, kind of preaching from their own pulpit, if you will, uh, the one side says, uh, Pastor, you can't say black lives matter. Because if you say that, then you are for protests. If you're for protests, you're for rioting. If you're for rioting, and it just keeps going. So, Pastor, you can't say black lives matter. Then on the other side, I'm told that um, another perspective from another platform, if you will, there's this voice in our culture that is saying, and I'm, I'm hearing this voice say to me, Pastor, you must say that law enforcement is racist. All law enforcement is racist. You must say that. 
If you don't say that, then you are for the brutal beating of black people. If you don't say that, then you are just uh, lifting up the system and you, you're, you're blind to the issues. And it goes on and on from there. And often what we do in this dialogue that's coming from these two sides is that we, we use statistics to prove you wrong, but my statistics trump your statistics. Well, how about this story? And then we get that story that's the antidote to this story. And we, everybody's talking about how we need to have dialogue and conversation, but we've created rigid rules around our language so that you must speak my language before I can talk to you. And this side says, no, 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 you must speak my language before I talk to you. This side, one of the biggest voices in our culture right now is Fox News. It produces a lot of this and blogs and other media. This side, one of the biggest voices that's saying the things from here, the idea that you must say all law enforcement is racist, this comes from an MSNBC perspective. Now, let me just encourage you to turn some of that off. Because we're, we're, we're hearing these voices, and I think we're not hearing the voice of God in the midst of this. And I am grieved over that. And I want to make sure that as we talk about these four Beatitudes, the last half of the Beatitudes, I think there are great principles for us in addressing this. And I've come to the conclusion as I've wrestled and prayed and, and thought this week and just asked God to lead me and stu study the scriptures and study this passage that God gave us this passage because it fits so well for what we need to hear right now. Maybe we need to turn off these voices. Something I did several months ago is I, I, I try to, if I, ever, if I do watch the news, I try not to too much anymore because they're just shouting at each other. But if I do watch, I try to watch one hour of MSNBC and one hour of Fox. And some of you are saying, oh my goodness, I could never do that. But sometimes difficult. I don't agree with everything I hear. And I'm learning that I don't agree more with, with stuff I'm hearing on both sides. Um, with my blogs, I've picked like four conservative blogs and four liberal blogs. And I look at those. And it's funny, the story will come out and it'll be the same exact content. And they come away with exactly the opposite things and start shouting again. I don't think there's going to be much resolution here. In the kingdoms of earth, there is no way for there to be resolution and healing. It's going to take a long time. But when we who know Christ in our own lives, and then we in the church, and then we affect our community, and we move forward in this, we can listen to the voice of God and should listen to the voice of God. And I think as I've studied the scriptures this week, the voice of God allows me to say several things that are going to offend either side. I believe I can say black lives matter. I believe I can say not every police officer is a racist. The vast majority are not. I believe I can say peaceful riots are good. But, and even if they're disturbing, that's good. But when they turn violent and they threaten people and they bring harm and they bring destruction, they're wrong. Riots are bad and looting is bad. Protests are good. And we have to understand that there is systemic racial injustice. It does exist. And that America needs racial reconciliation. Now that everybody has found offense in something I have said, I want to explain through the Beatitudes how I can make those kinds of statements. Let's look at the fifth Beatitude. It's found here in uh, verse 7 of Matthew chapter 5. With that as a backdrop, please hear my heart. Listen to the message. Listen to what I'm going to share. And you'll understand why I believe I can come to the conclusion to say that black lives matter. Not all police are racist. Systemic racial injustice exists. Peaceful protests are good. Violent riots and looting are bad. And America needs racial reconciliation. The fifth beatitude is to extend compassion to people who don't expect it. To extend compassion to people who don't expect it. Verse 7, blessed are the merciful. And that word can be translated compassion. Many times in the New Testament it is. For they will be shown mercy. You think, oh, so if you show mercy to someone, then you will be shown mercy by God. You'll go to heaven. And some people take another reference Jesus says where he says, if you don't forgive here on earth, my Father will not forgive you in heaven. But when you understand the con uh, con uh, content, content or the context of all of this, these two comments, you understand what's being said is those who know the Father will be merciful and they will experience mercy from him. Those who, who are forgiving of others, that's an evidence they, they have been forgiven by God and he will continue to forgive them until they're in his presence. 
But this idea of merciful is important for us right now. It's important in our culture. The word compassion and or the word mercy speaks volumes in the scripture. It's, it's used over and over again. And when Jesus says, blessed are the merciful, we have to stop and say, okay, where does mercy begin? Mercy is you don't give someone what they deserve. Thankfully, our God has been merciful to us. We all deserve the judgment of God because we're all sinners. But in his mercy, God has loved us and he sent Jesus to die for us so that when Christ was on the cross, he took all of the punishment I deserve, all of the punishment you deserve, upon himself. He became the substitutionary sacrifice for us. Then he was buried and then he was raised from the dead and he conquered death and any lingering effect of, of, of the curse on death for us and removed the sting of death forever. That's God's mercy. And if you haven't come to faith in Jesus Christ, before you can ever extend mercy in a, in a true, uh, godly way from, from his kingdom values, not earthly kingdom values, you have to come to receive his mercy yourself. You just pray and you tell God, I get it. I, I, I fall short of who you are. I know I don't measure up and never will, but I put my faith in you. Thank you for your mercy. I receive your mercy and grace to me. Now, maybe you've done that today. Maybe you did that last week or a couple of weeks ago or a month ago. And, you, and we'd love to have you share that with us because we'd love to celebrate and encourage you in your new life in Christ. Right below me is a phone number if you text the name Jesus, just Jesus in the message of the text to the number below me. Uh, you'll get an encouraging video back from me about your new walk in Christ. And we'll have someone on our team this week contact you. Make sure you understand what God's doing in your life, what it means now to have his mercy in your life, to be his child. But we'd love to celebrate that with you. Because the, the starting point of understanding compassion and mercy is to, to start with the compassion and mercy of God. So let's talk about this. Extend compassion to people who don't expect it. Micah 6.8 that we looked at last week says, He has shown you, O mortal, what is good and what does the Lord require of you. Now this was written at a time when God is pronouncing a judgment on his people, the nation of Israel, because they were practicing injustices against each other. They were mistreating each other, pushing each other down so that they could be more wealthy, so that they could get more power, so that they could have, have more of the pleasures of the world. And there was a lot of injustice going on. And God says, you know, I'm tired of this immorality. I'm tired of this injustice. I'm going to bring judgment. And Micah kind of has a conversation with God for his people. And he says, all right, Lord, what do the people need to do? to receive your mercy and not to have this judgment fall? Do they need to make sacrifices? Do, do they need to make, uh, uh, do they need to do, do a bunch of works, good things? What, what do you want them to do to prove to you their love? And the Lord responds to act justly. This is what the Lord requires of you, to act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. There's gotta be a humility and we've got to look at the world and understand the injustices and we need to make decisions that bring justice and righteousness into situations in our own lives and in the areas we have, have influence. But we've got to love mercy. Not just say, oh, it's nice there's mercy that God has given to us. We've got to love the mercy God has given us and we've got to then be merciful toward others. People that it's hard for us to show mercy to. There's a mercy needed between these voices. That's why the people have got, to have got to step in and say, here's the voice of God in this situation. We need to love mercy. Now, mercy comes out, I think, in a number of ways. Kindness, empathy, patience toward others, even forgiveness. When we think of kindness. I just want to thank you for your kindness as you give to Calvary. Uh, we've been able to do some things in, in helping people affected by COVID-19 all around the world. In some of the remote parts of the world and some of the developing countries, there are people who are starving because the food chain has just broken down so badly. As a matter of fact, our partner in Honduras, Gloria Del Cid, in the community where she serves, not only are people hungry, but they went 40 or 50 days without water, fresh water. And so she reached out to us, and through our giveaway dollars, we were able to give thousands of dollars to help Gloria get food for the folks there in Honduras. You're seeing the pictures on the screen of the families and the kids. Matter of fact, in that setting, there was one pastor who said other organizations had given him food to give to his people, but Gloria had asked him what he needed, and no one had done that, and what a blessing that was to him. And so we were able to provide through Gloria uh, resources for that man and his family. It goes beyond Honduras. I talked about how we're working with African Renewal Ministries 
in Uganda. They're feeding 300 families through the support we're giving them. Our friends at Bayamba, God Cares School, the Kabbalagala Church, the Dango family, they have uh, received funds from us just recently, and they're going to be feeding 400 people and, and others who are part of the school that's there. Uh, So that means 700 families are being taken care of and fed by the folks here at Calvary. In Mexico, in Ensenada, among the Kumeyaay tribe on their reservation, uh, through our partners on the ground, we're we're feeding 80 families there. In Zimbabwe, through the Crowdus, 300 families are being fed through thousands of dollars that have been sent from, from Calvary to help. In the Dominican Republic, which with our partners at Project Manana, uh, we're feeding 250 families. And we're going to continue to find ways to resource these folks and to make sure that families are affected. With these and those we're supporting through our, our partnership in, in Southeast Asia, uh, we're probably feeding 8,000 people, not just the family units, but people. And that's a pretty conservative number. And I say that to say, this is a part of the kindness. We must continue. We must grow that. We must build that. We're doing things locally with our food pantry and with our fresh market. And we've had so many of you brought some food pantry items on Mondays and Tuesdays. We've been able to share it with other ministries. That's a kindness. That's extending compassion. Some of those folks didn't expect that in these remote places in the world, to have food given to them in Jesus' name. Kindness. But also empathy is a part of this compassion. Empathy. We've got to hear the story of others. You see, when, when we're just exchanging statistics and stories and we're shouting louder or we're, we're arguing with each other, there isn't a hearing of stories. There's no attempt to see the world through that person's eyes. There's no attempt to see the world through this person's eyes. I've talked to black parents who talk about how important it is for them to believe that the people around them, their church, their culture, Believe that black lives matter. And I know folks say, well, well, can't we just say all lives matter? I understand that. But as I've listened to this community, kind of the illustration that's come to my mind is it's the story of a house that was on fire. And the fire company comes and firefighters arrive and the house is in flames. There are four children in the family two parents, the two parents and the two older children get out of the fire. And the mom says, my little ones, my my babies are up there on the second floor. We couldn't get to them. My babies' lives, they matter. And the the fire folks are able to get equipment to the second floor window and they're able to get a heroic fireman through the window and he he gets in and he gets both the, the newborn baby and the child that's almost two, the two babies and brings them out and brings them down. And when he gets down, a reporter goes up to him and says to him, you're a hero, why did you do that? And he responds, because those babies' lives mattered. And she doesn't go on to say, well, but don't the babies down the street and the babies over there matter? Because she understands what the firefighter understands in the heart of that mother, that the house is on fire, her her kids are at risk, And what I hear from my black brothers and sisters right here, a part of Calvary and in our community and relationships I have across the country is that they sense and feel the house is on fire and that there's greater risk. And you can argue and say that's not true or that's not this. This is the the ability to empathize and to see life and experience through the eyes of someone else. And I've had to grow in my understanding and awareness and empathy with black people. I grew up uh, 18 years, didn't have any blacks in school around me or, or uh, in the neighborhood or anything like that. Um, we, in our church in Mishawaka, Indiana, in the city next door was South Bend, Indiana. And uh, once a year at our missions conference in our church, George Joseph and his wife came over. He was a black inner city pastor in South Bend with a ministry. He preached at our missions conference. Boy, when he would preach, I'd wake up and listen as a kid because it was dynamic. But that's, that's the exposure I had until I went off to college. And even there, it was a vastly predominantly white setting. And, and, and uh, most of my settings have been like that. And I, I need to, to pay attention and empathize and not just see it through my grid or through what someone's told me and the voice I'm listening to, but see it holistically. That's how I can say black lives matter and protests are important. But then I also have to empathize with those who are in law enforcement. I have to empathize with their situation too. A young wife uh, reached out to me this week and asked me if I would pray for her husband who was down in L.A. and she could see him on CNN and 
could I pray for him or not? And I said, definitely I can pray for him. He's a hero in my mind. We celebrated when Borderline took place how officers went in. Sergeant Hewless gave his life for others. We talked in 911 about firefighters, and we've been talking, and police, and the, the, the value they brought, the heroic efforts. And I don't think that policemen I know, we've got a lot of policemen here, part of Calvary, I don't think they get up in the morning and say, how can I hurt someone of color today? And so I told that woman, yeah, your, your husband's a hero of mine. I, I will pray for him. I'll pray for you. We need to hear the hearts of that, of that wife, of a husband who's, whose wife is in law enforcement. We need to hear the, the hearts of the mothers and the fathers. We need to hear the hearts of the children. Not just those on one side or the other, but we need to empathize with someone who has a different position than us. We need to see life through their eyes. You say, well, wait a minute, you just supported law enforcement. Uh, you, I thought you said there was systemic racial injustice. There is. Here's kind of how I make the distinction. You see, the scriptures say, I am a minister, right? I'm a minister. The scriptures also say in Romans 13 that the governing authorities are put in place uh, to reward what is good and punish what is bad to keep the peace. And that, that clearly then teaches that police officers are ministers of God to our world and our community. Now, I know my own profession. We've had some problems. If you look at the Catholic Church, you look at some of the Protestant denominations, some of the evangelical groups and churches, we've had an issue with abuse, whether it's abuse of women or children. You know, the Catholic Church, as they did their study, they discovered that there, was, there, there were systems and culture that allowed bad actors to come in and, and even those in a weak moment to act in a way that, that was inappropriate, even if they didn't have a pattern. And then there were systems of injustice where, where priests and others were transferred other places and, and abuse continued because the system and the culture allowed that. And I know it's different than race, but, but you have to understand, if someone said that all pastors abuse children, That'd be a problem to me. Now, do we have evangelical churches that have that same issue? Yes, that's why we have strict child protection policies here at Calvary, because we want to protect children. We want to make sure there isn't a system or a culture that allows any of that to happen. Many denominations have put those things in place. The Catholic Church has made all kinds of corrections. But because there's maybe some laws that were written a long time ago or there were good intended things, even the 1990s, the crime bill, both sides of the aisle voted on that crime bill. And now they look back and realize that while it solved some issues, it actually created a huge issue of disproportionate sentences and, and punishment of people of color. And now people are looking at that going, wow, we didn't mean for that to happen. We were trying to actually make some corrections, which there were some tweaks here, but we made it worse here. Sometimes well-intentioned people add to the systemic injustice. Sometimes we rush forward and we don't listen and empathize. And we've got to listen and empathize. I want to hear the heart of that black mom. I want to hear the heart of that policeman's wife. I, as a shepherd, want to shepherd all of these people, as many as will journey with us forward into reconciliation. But it's going to take empathy. It's going to take patience toward each other. It's going to take forgiveness, forgiveness. Part of what I've been doing and learning and being aware, I, I've been reading some books. One of the books I read by a Christian author and lawyer, Brian Stevenson, a few years ago is Just Mercy. It's a story of justice and redemption. And, and you know, at first, I, a couple chapters I want to put down because I didn't agree with everything, but I said, you know what, I want to be open and listen. When you read a book like this, just be open and listen. See what you can learn. Be humble. Love mercy. Look for a way to find mercy in this situation. Sometimes one side says, well, if you get the law and order straight, then we can straighten this out. Or one side says, if you get this straight, we can straighten this out. And just mercy, it just kind of unravels the problem and, and begins to address how we can deal with that. Right now, the movie Just Mercy that just came out last year based on the book is free on any platform where it was being rented or you could rent it. Uh, for the month of June, they've made it free so we can begin to understand it. It's, it's one of the good resources I would recommend to you. It's a great way to be aware. And look at the title, Just Mercy. That's what Jesus said, blessed are the merciful. Read the book saying, how can we show mercy in these kinds of situations? Don't start with just it's wrong or judgmental. How can we show mercy? And I mentioned forgiveness is a key part of this. All kinds of research shows people who say they're happy, the number one indicator that keep, keeps coming up in surveys is that they forgive others and they feel like they've been forgiven of others. There's no bitterness 
Forgiveness is important. We're very familiar with the Dylan Roof story. The story was retold in a book I read this week called Be the Bridge. This is the, if there's one book I would encourage you to read in the next six weeks, this is the book by Latasha Morrison, Pursuing God's Heart for Racial Reconciliation. See, I think that pursuing God's heart for racial recognition is what we ought to be doing. Not saying I'm pursuing uh, one organization's perspective or, or one organization's perspective or all the different voices on either side. I don't, I don't agree with all those different voices on either side. But I want to pursue God's heart for reconciliation. This is a great resource. In there, she tells the story of Dylan Roof. I want to just remind you of the story as I read her, her version of that as she tells it in this book. And she gives a great perspective. She's a black woman who used to be on staff at a church that was very much like Calvary, predominantly white, and what she learned. And just a great voice in my life. Very biblical, very Christ-centered. On June 17th, 2015, Dylan Roof entered Mother Emanuel AME Church, a historically black church in Charleston, South Carolina. He'd come to study the Bible, he said, and despite the fact that he was the only white person among the 12 Mother Emanuel members in attendance, the congregants welcomed him with open arms and without suspicion. Roof sat next to senior pastor and state senator Clementa Pickney and asked questions. Toward the end of the study, he openly disagreed with the group members about their interpretation of the scriptures, but they remained gracious. And then when the group bowed in a closing prayer, Roof stood, pulled a gun from his backpack, and started shooting. She goes on to say he killed nine, nine individuals of the 12. Two acted like they were dead and survived, and one, he said, I'm letting you live to tell the story of what happened here today. She talks about watching that coverage and thinking about that happening in such a historic black church in the South that went all the way back to the days uh, of slavery. And she talked about how for the African-American community, the church is the center of politics and education and economics and religion and so much of who they are. It's where the civil rights movement started. She said, throughout so much of our history, the black church was the only place we could express the fullness of our humanity. There we had dignity. There we were not called boy or negro or even worse. There our men were called deacon or brother or pastor. Black women in church became the center, of, excuse me, black women were not viewed as second class mammies, but were called mother or sister. The black church became the center of our culture and community, the place where the civil rights movement was born. Now our safe haven had been turned into a slaughterhouse. My heart ached, Morrison writes. And then she talks about how Dylan Roof uh, made a manifesto in prison where he said he'd do it all over again. He was trying to incite a race riot. He said all kinds of negative, nasty things about black people, and he never did regret or repent. She writes, days after the murder, Roof was led to court for his arraignment. Their family members and friends of those slaughtered were given an opportunity to face him. Nadine Collier, who was a mother, whose mother was one of the nine church members killed, said, I forgive you. She looked at Ruth and said, I forgive you. You took something really precious away from me. I will never talk to her ever again. I will never be able to hold her again. But I forgive you and have mercy on your soul. Notice that, have mercy on your soul. It hurts me. It hurts a lot of people, but God forgive you. And I forgive you. Anthony Thompson, family member of victim Myra Thompson, said, I forgive you. And my family forgives you. We would like you to take this opportunity to repent, to repent, confess, and to give your life to the one who matters most, Christ, so he can change your ways no matter what happens to you. The sister of DePayne Middleton doctor said, I'm a work in progress, and I acknowledge that I am very angry. She taught me that we are family. We are the family that love built. We have no room for hate, so we have to forgive. These statements by the family members were bold and beautiful and true examples of forgiveness of Christ. How true that is. Forgiveness. We need to forgive one another when we don't say the right words. We've got to forgive one another, give each other space. We need to, as the, the Beatitude says, be merciful. Extend compassion to people who don't expect it. The sixth beatitude is found in verse eight. It's this, invite God to search your heart. Invite God to search your heart. Because this is gonna begin within us, not just what we do on the outside, not just through standing up and, and, and uh, championing a cause, but it's gonna be in our hearts. 
Verse 8 says, blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Those who have a pure heart have been redeemed by Christ. They're clothed in his righteousness, and they are sealed until they're with him. They will see God. But there's a part of the pure heart as we walk here on earth that as our lives get dirty with sin, we confess it and forsake it. And as we do, God is faithful and just, John tells us, to forgive us of all unrighteousness. I love how the Old Testament uh, psalmist put it in Psalm 139, verses 23 and 24. I have prayed these verses every day this week, and I'm gonna continue to do that for I don't know how long. Search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. That's an invitation for God to look and find the places of pride and lust and greed. Look for those pockets where I may have bias or prejudice, not necessarily overt acts of racism, but sometimes we have baked in in our own unawareness of others, biases and prejudices. We need to ask God to expose those, show, show the light in that area of immorality, that wrong thinking, that bitterness, whatever it is. And then notice the psalmist says in verse 24, see if there is any offensive way in me. Point it out, convict me. And when he convicts us and the guilt, guilt comes, we confess and he forgives. And then look at the invitation here. And lead me in the way everlasting. Lord, look at my heart, my mind. Look at my anxious thoughts, my divided thoughts. Look at all that's going on. Show me those places and pockets of wrong and evil and darkness. As I confess those things, then I ask you to lead me in the way everlasting. Lead me in righteousness. Move me forward. One of the great things about the voice of God when it comes to any issue that we face, our community faces or our nation faces, is yes, he may cause us to face the reality and even deal with guilt and conviction. But as we experience his forgiveness among one another and in our own hearts, he then moves us forward. What happens with these voices is as they keep shouting at each other, nobody's going anywhere. And Satan loves that. Satan wants both of them to entrench further and further and further in their position so there could be no movement forward of healing in America. And I think it's high time the church stopped listening to the voice of Sean Hannity or Rachel Maddow and start listening to the voice of God. And that begins with inviting him to inspect our own hearts. And I've been asking God to do that. He's shown me some things, some attitudes. He's shown me some other stuff unrelated to that as well. Be careful when you invite him in. We need to have a pure heart as we speak into this in our community, in our world. The seventh beatitude is to bring people together who like being apart. There's a certain way in which some of these people make their money staying in their positions. And some people just don't want to go through the messiness of hearing someone's story or understanding it. Understanding it. What, I, what I hear a lot of my white friends do is they hear a story and they have to tell a different story that negates that story. Can't we listen to one another's stories? Can't we who are in the majority here listen to the story of those who have a different experience, totally different than a kid who was raised in Mishawaka, Indiana? We need to bring people together who like being apart. Jesus said in this seventh beatitude, blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called the children of God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called the children of God. Notice that this this is an active thing. It doesn't say blessed are those who have peace. Blessed are those who encourage peace. A peacemaker is an active thing of stepping into a space and speaking into division and helping people have conversation and dialogue that moves forward in healing. We're to be peacemakers, to be actively finding ways to promote and encourage peace and to bring people together. Romans 12, 18 says, if it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. It begins with us living at peace with others and then being able to speak into the space where there are distinctions and rifts between individuals, even in the issue of race. Now with this word peacemaker, you know, that's, that's you know, here's peacemaker, but some of us think, no, my role in culture is to be an agitator a lot of evangelicals think that that's our real role is just to agitate and stir up. No, we're to be the peacemakers. Some people think, well, I'll just stay neutral. 
No, we're to be peacemakers. We're to actively engage. We should be the ones who are building bridges. Building bridges between people. Building bridges between us and others. People that are different than us. People that see the world totally different than us. I'm not talking about compromise. I'm not saying let's take a little of this and mesh it together. I'm talking about us bringing God's kingdom values into this. Shining light on this. So that, yes, there are threads of truth in this and threads of truth in this. And we need to bring those things. And how are they defined by truth? Do they match the voice of God? And then we need to encourage people to hear each other's hearts. To get rid of the rigid rules of language. I know language is important, but people's hearts are important. The book by Morrison, Build a Bridge, talks about that. And how we can do that. She, she has scriptures in here. She has study guide questions at the end. Group questions at the end of each chapter. It's a short book. It takes about six hours to listen to it on Audible. It says it takes seven to eight hours to read it. If you read this book, you, you're, you're going to read the first couple chapters and say, I don't know what Thornton's saying. I can't read that. Because you say it, it's, it, 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 it's talking about Black Lives Matter. She doesn't bring that up till like the later chapter. But you're going to say, I can't read that. Others are going to say, I can't read that because it, it doesn't go far enough. It doesn't condemn police enough. Read the whole book if you open it. Like I'm asking for my message here, her out. I, I, I love her heart. I love how she handles the scripture. I, I love how she points to Christ. Parts of it made me uncomfortable and convicted. Parts of it I'm still wrestling with. I don't agree with everything in, in it as it comes out. But she gives a basic process of how we can be bridge builders. Starting with our own hearts and lives and our church and our community. You can go to her, the website of, of her organization. Go to bethebridge.com. There are resources there and more information there. Bethebridge.com. This coming Wednesday, June 10th, there's going to be an IF gathering. Some of you ladies are familiar with the IF conference, the IF gathering. They're going to have one that you can watch, a webinar. Go to tv.ifgathering.com, and uh, Latasha Morrison will be one of the speakers on that, talking about racial reconciliation and the part the church has in that. I hope you hunger and desire for righteousness, and you want to pursue uh, God's heart for racial reconciliation. Here's, here's a resource. We need to be the peacemakers not the agitators. We don't need to be Switzerland and be neutral. We need to be engaged in bringing peace. Eighth, the eighth beatitude is we gotta be willing to suffer for doing good. Well, this doesn't sound like a fast way to being happy, does it? It's like mourning. Blessed are those who mourn. That makes you happy? Well, you face the reality. And here it is, as you say, you're only gonna be happy if you live according to the way Jesus wants you to live, if you love the way Jesus wants you to love. And if you become the peacemaker he wants you to be. If you follow these beatitudes, the final beatitude says, if you live by the other nine, you're probably going to suffer for it. Well, that's real positive, Sean. Thank you for that. Verse 10, Jesus said, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Justice is a part of that righteousness. Holiness that we sang about is a part of that. When we live morally the way God wants, we're, we're free of greed and we're more generous when, we're, when, when we're, we're more about love than we are about lust and we've got the right perspective and righteousness and we're seeking to live it. People won't like it. We'll suffer for doing good. And what Gina read a little bit ago, the last two verses of the Beatitudes, verses 11 and 12, uh, kind of explain why number eight, the last one, is what happens to you when you fulfill the other seven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad because great is your reward in heaven. It will be worth it all when we see Jesus. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. For in the same way. They persecuted the prophets. When the prophets said, hey, I speak for God, many kings had their heads chopped off. Say, well, aren't we called to live in love like Jesus? Shouldn't that make us just so received by everybody? Somebody, some, some people will receive us. Some people will receive us for a while until our values, our kingdom values clash with their earthly values. Maybe we've talked so much about living and loving like Jesus that we haven't talked about as Jesus lived and loved, especially in those public three years of ministry, he lived and loved in such an incredible way and we wanna, we wanna live and love like he did. 
But remember how that ended up for him. He suffered for doing good. He was beaten and tried, and rejected and crucified. But the scriptures call that his joy because he was doing it for the good of others and the glory of God. You gotta be willing to suffer for doing good. Jesus said so clearly the night before he was crucified in the upper room, he said to his disciples, if the world hates you, keep in mind that it hated me first. <laughs> so how are we going to, in God's sovereignty, he put us right in the middle of the Beatitudes during this stuff in our culture. And I know there are many other applications and you can look in your own life and let the spirit search you. But if you want to be happy and you want to build these things into your life, you need to build into your life an understanding of who you are before God. You got to grieve over the growing of this world. You got to show a surprising gentleness toward others. Cultivate a deep longing for righteousness. Extend compassion to people who don't expect it. Invite God to search your heart. Bring people together who like being apart. Be willing to suffer for doing good. Because if you build these things in your life, you just might suffer for doing good. So let me ask you, are you building these practices into your life? Are you building these things into your life? What now? Well, pray over the eight Beatitudes. Pray over them. Maybe you need to show compassion and mercy to someone. Maybe you need to thank a police officer and say you pray for their family. Maybe you need to stop and ask a black person to share their story with you and hear it. Don't argue with it, hear it. Maybe you need to read Psalm 139, 23 and 24 each day this week and ask God to search your heart for those pockets of greed and pride and lust and prejudice. Pray over them. Invite God to search your heart as I just said. Take Psalm 139, 23 and 24 and do that. Thirdly, read Be the Bridge, Pursuing God's Heart for Racial Reconciliation. Like I said, you won't be comfortable with all of it. It'll be convicting. It's been convicting for me. But she's using scripture. I'm hearing her story. I'm hearing other stories she's telling. I'm beginning to understand why what's going on right now was, was inflamed by the death of George Floyd. But it goes way back. And if you say, well, they, they just got to get over slavery. That's so calloused and so missing the point of what's been told them, what they've experienced, what these dear folks, our brothers and sisters of color, and right now especially those who are black, they're feeling and experiencing. This is a great resource to understand that. Pursuing God's Heart for Racial Recognition, Latasha Morrison. It's available, I know, on Audible and Kindle. I'm not sure if the book is available. There's been a high demand for that. We're getting this for all of our staff. I'm going to ask our elders and our staff leadership to go, go through this, get this book, read it. Over the next six to eight weeks, allow God to make you aware, get you into the process of being a part of pursuing God's heart for reconciliation. And then we're looking at ways of asking Carolyn Takeda, our pastor of small groups, to look at different ways that maybe we could have some groups where we could get these bridge builder groups that Morrison talks about and we can grow together. I think this is a great way to keep sharing the gospel and keep making disciples and have an influence in our world. But if we keep just listening to this voice, pastor, you can't say... Black Lives Matter, because then all of this is true. Pastor, you can't say, you must say, excuse me, you must say all law enforcement is racist and everything that goes with that will be true if you don't. We need to, fourthly, give people grace as they express themselves and seek to grow. To my black brothers and sisters, I want to say, I'm not always going to say it right, but I want to hear you and I want to learn and I want to grow. To those who are concerned about the heroes of our police force, I pray for them. I celebrate them. I want to say thank you to them. But I also know that we've got a lot of work to do to make sure the policies and the procedures by which they operate, the training, the laws by which uh, they keep the law are addressed and make sure they're not adding to racial injustice. And even creating a culture where some folks can create overt acts or do overt acts of racism. Give people grace as they express themselves and seek to grow. Give grace to these voices. But let me tell you, to do that, you're going to have to stop feeding on just the voice that agrees with you or just the voice that agrees with you on this side. And we need to listen to the voice that's going to bring conviction and is going to help us live out Christ's kingdom here and now. And his values, as he laid them out in the Sermon on the Mount, as described right here in the Beatitudes. Will you pray with me? Father, I pray that you would help my heart 
to be humble, to be teachable, to be willing to listen, to empathize. Father, thank you for the voices from the black community that have been so clear in my life. Help us to seek out voices to listen to. And Father, I pray that you would protect police officers. I think of the families here that are concerned of a son or a daughter or a husband or a wife or a mom or a dad. I pray you would bring peace to their hearts and I pray for protection. I pray these protests as they would be vocal would be peaceful. Father, help us to just have the heart of Christ. Often, most of his ministry, people said, you got to pick this side or that side. And if you pick that side, then this. And Jesus said, no, I'm, I'm here with a different kingdom. And may we who are the followers of Christ live out those kingdom values today, tomorrow, and this week. May our church be a part of that healing amongst ourselves and within our church community and then into our local community, into our nation and our world. I pray this, that it might be for the good of others, but that it also might bring glory to you who made each of us in your image. And you love each of us just the same. And you're seeking the best for each of us, no matter what our color. Thank you, Father, for Jesus' example. May we live it out. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. At this time, you can give to the Lord's work here at Calvary. You can support uh, the ministry of VBS that's coming up, like Pastor Jeremy. I, I, I'm praying for two or 3,000. We usually have about 800 kids, but if we could get two or 3,000 virtually, grandmas and grandpas can invite their grandkids to join, and the gospel can spread. Kids can have fun, but they can learn about Christ. That's a great thing. And as you give to the offering, you support those kind of ministries. As you give, you support the, the ministry of uh, the food that we're doing around the world and other things we're doing to help around the world as we seek to give away thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars so that we can show the mercy and compassion of Christ, not just here, but all around the world. You can give online. You can mail in your check while, while we're, our campus is not a part of our ministry and we're not functioning on our campus. It's a great way to just uh, send a check or go online to give. God bless you for your generosity. Your kindness to God's work is translated into kindness in ministry. This final song is one, Michelle, you suggested to me a couple weeks ago that maybe we conclude the Beatitudes. There's a lot of, this. the whole thing is happy, 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 but there's some serious stuff here and serious stuff in our world. But ultimately, there is this happiness despite circumstances, this joy that comes from the Lord, and it's that joy that comes from the Lord that is our strength. And thanks for the suggestion. She thought, what if we showed images, some of the joy and the happiness of people engaged in various activities and ministries of Calvary? And we just saw the smile on their face. And so this goes back for the past year. And I think this is going to be a blessing to you. Don't, don't turn off your device just yet. Keep watching because this is a blessing. Look at the smiling, wonderful faces where the joy of the Lord is our strength as a part of the Calvary family. Thank you, Michelle, for suggesting it. And may this song bless you. And may you go out and seek to bring his kingdom into this world that so deeply needs the kingdom of God.